Good afternoon and welcome to another Research in Action brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. My name is Karen Scapinato. I will be today's moderator. With that, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Grant, Dr. Patrick Grant, who is an Associate Professor in FAU's College of Medicine in the Department of Biomedical Science. Dr. Grant received his uh, bachelor's degrees from the uh, University of Portsmouth in um, the UK, and then his PhD in medicine from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden before coming to the US to Penn State as a um, postdoc. And uh, he then started his first, uh, his own lab at the University of Virginia before coming to FAU. Dr. Grant's uh, research expertise and interest lies in genetics, specifically epigenetics. And I'm going to let him tell you what that actually means. Welcome, Dr. Grant. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. I'd like to thank um, Dr. Scott Panato also for the invitation to, to talk today and uh, to also thank Gina for her uh, help in setting up this uh, presentation. Um, so it's a, a pleasure for me to, to talk to everybody today. Um, thank you for logging in. Um, and let me share my screen. And so today I'm going to talk about um, uh, whether or not we can turn our genes on and off. And specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, epigenetics and why we should care about this field. It might be something you're not familiar with, um, but it, essentially um, epigenetics is a mechanism of regulation of how our genes are uh, um, activated or, or turned off. Um, and the interesting thing about epigenetic regulation of our genes is that um, Sometimes these uh, pathways can be inherited in our children and our grandchildren. And I'm going to give you some examples of that today and then talk about the research that we do here at FAU. So the hum Human Genome Project was a, um, an investment by a number of different research laboratories around the world, um, many in the United States, to sequence the human genome. Uh, it's a 13 year project from start to finish. Um, before we could sequence all of our DNA, all of the letters on our chromosomes um, that encode for all of our genes, um, that make us, you know, pattern our bodies and make us who we are. Um, and these sequences that exist in our DNA um, essentially um, encode for things like proteins um, and give all of the instructions our cells need and our bodies need to function. However, um, the Human Genome Project was really just the beginning. And even though that was a 13 year project, um, the future is, is still in front of us. And, and in this cover of Time Magazine from 2010 illustrates uh, essentially what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and that's why is it that our DNA isn't our only destiny. Um, and this was a, the cover from time in, in 2010, and it kind of illustrates that there's actually another layer to, to our DNA and, and the regulation of our genes, um, which is this um, epigenetic regulation. So to understand this, I kind of want to briefly just mention something um, about how our DNA is stored in our cells. Um, it's contained in the nucleus of the cells, so it's kind of an, an envelope, if you will, where we put all of the letters of our DNA and our chromosomes. And the DNA itself um, isn't just naked, but it's actually wrapped around a set of proteins, and these proteins are called histones. And histones essentially wrap our DNA in a way that's analogous to winding thread around a tuna can. And then these tuna cans kind of stack upon themselves and package away our DNA um, onto the chromosomes in our nucleus. So what is the reason for this? Um, in the human cell, we have about two meters of DNA, but that's placed into a nucleus, which is only five to 10 uh, micrometers wide. So it's a lot of information 
that we have to store in a small space. So imagine writing out 3 billion um, letters um, on paper uh, in pairs, um, and then trying to fit that letter into an envelope. We have to have sophisticated ways to kind of package all that information that we need to make um, and encode all the instructions we have to make a human being. So the analogy that I like to use is this one, which came from a scientist called Craig Peterson and someone working for him, Mark Andre Lania. So imagine trying to stuff about 10,000 miles of spaghetti inside a basketball. So that's the equivalent of us trying to get that two meters of DNA into a cell nucleus. Um, so if that wasn't difficult enough, try to find a unique one inch segment of that pasta from the middle of this and try to maybe duplicate it, untangle it, um, separate the DNA out. Um, and that's the kind of things we need to do when we uh, maybe turn a gene off or perhaps even turn a gene uh, on. So it's kind of a daunting task where, where that lays in front of us of, you know, the machinery within our cells uh, to package up this DNA, but then to access it when it's needed. So this brings me to the field of epigenetics, which I'm gonna focus on today. Um, and as this might not be something you're all familiar with, um, epigenetics is a term that was uh, first coined by this guy, Hal Waddington in the United Kingdom. And he defined it as a branch of biology which studies the causal interactions between genes and their products, products which bring the phenotype into being. So essentially, he was suggesting that beyond the DNA, there's another level of control which makes us essentially who we are. Um, so genetics is something you might be familiar with, particularly the study of DNA and inherited uh, molecules. Um, epi basically is a Greek preface, which means in addition to or over. So epigenetics is um, the study of everything that regulates our genetic information um, encoded in our DNA. So what is it, uh, epigenetics? So genes, as I mentioned, provide the basic template, all the instructions that our body cells, uh, our body cells need to survive and, and to function. Um, and epigenetics refers to changes in gene activity, that's where the genes are turned on and off, that are not based on alterations of DNA sequence. Okay, so the DNA stays the same, but the gene can be turned on and off like a light switch. So epigenetic regulation is one of the ways which helps uh, a cell uh, decide which gene is turned on and when it's turned on. Subsequently, epigenetics controls what instructions reach a cell and it controls the cell's actions and functions and the functions of our tissues and perhaps even our behaviors. So, the interesting thing is we're learning probably in more recent years than, than um, could have been imagined when epigenetics was first emerging, emerging is that epigenetic, epigenetic responses to environmental experiences can turn uh, genes on and off. And it's actually possible to transmit these changes down to successive generations. And so I'm gonna give you some examples of that today and, and some that I find particularly interesting. Um, so how do we do this? How, how does epigenetics work? Um, the mechanisms that control um, gene expression are numerous, um, but today I'm gonna to focus on our chemical marks on our DNA or on the histone proteins. So these are the protein, the tuna can, proteins that package our DNA away, um, because I think we know probably most um, about how these chemical marks function. Um, what we do here at FAU in our lab is we study how these marks are written, how they're removed, and how they're read. Um, and this, this is kind of a, an evolving field. 
So what I mean by this is that on our DNA and maybe in our grandparent, um, there are um, chemical marks that are on our DNA or on the histone proteins around which DNA is wrapped, which can be passed on to the next generation. Um, the daughter of this individual, for example, who might not have identical DNA because she has DNA inherited from both parents, but some of those marks are, are passed on to her and then sub subsequently on to her child as well. And so if those, those marks are dictating whether a particular gene is turned on or off, um, can, can change the outcome for that particular child. And this becomes interesting in medicine, for example, whereas these, these alterations may be uh, uh, disease-causing alterations, for example, or, or increased susceptibility to a certain disease, um, or, or perhaps they're beneficial. Okay, and I'll give you some examples of that today. So we can have these chemical marks, as I mentioned, um, which can be on DNA, which is illustrated right here as these um, circles, or on the histone proteins around which our DNA is wrapped. Um, and certain of these chemical marks can basically give a green light uh, for a, if they occur on top of a gene, for that gene to be turned on. Um, but another set of chemical marks um, or, or addition of certain marks, especially on DNA, will cause a gene to turn off. Uh, and one of, you, one of the things you might notice in this is that when genes are turned off, very frequently these tuna cans stack together um, and package away DNA quite tightly, making it a little bit more difficult to access and difficult for a gene to be active. Um, the interesting thing about these kind of uh, modifications, these marks um, on our DNA, is that they're reversible. So um, they respond to um, different kinds of experiences, um, environmental exposures. They change during aging, um, and they can um, be altered by certain mutations as well. Um, so it's quite, a, quite an interesting phenomenon as we start to unravel this is what kind of experiences in our life will turn on a given gene or turn mm -hmm. off a given gene? And what does that mean for us? And what does that mean for our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren? So um, some of the things that we, we think are impacting um, epigenetics are uh, lifestyle, so things like exercise, maybe um, stress, being rested, maybe you might be considered to be beneficial. Um, other impactors that maybe would be negative could be environmental influences. So things like pollution, uh, pesticides, um, and then there's a kind of a, a or everything in between, right? Maybe our diet, our uh, um, exposure to uh, sunlight, um, maybe too much, we consider might not, might not be a good thing, but maybe some is a positive thing. And then things like other kind of pollutions and uh, the choice to smoke um, may also impact these kind of processes. So epigenetics in action, um, when you think about environmental factors and how that might affect future generations, um, when you think about a mother who might be pregnant, um, you can imagine in certain environmental factors or exposures that that mother experiences during her pregnancy can affect the mother itself. It can also affect the fetus, developing fetus, um, but it also could potentially directly affect the third generation uh, because the reproductive cells or the, what we call the germline um, in the fetus is also present um, at, during this period of exposure. So environmental influences uh, in, in during pregnancy can, uh, can affect three generations um, at once. But what's also interesting is those um, influences and epigenetic changes and gene changes and whether genes are turned on and off are thought 
perhaps in some instances to even persist in future generations in individuals that never directly experienced those environmental factors. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of that, but um, of epigenetics and inheritance. And there's been um, a few studies um, that have statistically significant information over multiple generations that suggests we can inherit epigenetic traits from our ancestors. Um, so one example is this in this Dutch cohort. Um, it's a study from the, the Amsterdam and, and the Netherlands. Um, and essentially it involves a study of individuals who were um, part of a famine that occurred during 1944 to 1945 during World War II, when, the, when Nazi Germany occupied parts of, uh, of Holland and limited food supply there led to a famine. And that killed some 20,000 people. However, those who survived were also affected by this famine. And um, women um, who were pregnant during that period, 1944 to 45, who went through this famine, um, their children had an increased rate of metabolic syndrome and their grandchildren had increased uh, uh, obesity and poorer adult health. And some of the speculation for why that is, is that there was a response in, in the mothers during the famine um, to preserve energy, to, to store fat when possible, um, but also it's speculated that genes were activated in subsequent generations um, which increased um, food seeking behavior and particularly high calorie food. And in, in terms of, um, let's say transmission of important information, if that child is coming into a world where food is scarce, it does make sense that they would come into it thinking we should be looking for food, um, we should be eating as much as possible when food isn't very readily available. Um, another study, um, I'm going to dwell on this a little bit more, is something called the Erva Kallix uh, study, which comes from Sweden. And this is a particularly interesting one where it involves paternal exposure to high nutrient availability in childhood uh, that followed a year of low food availability. So in this study, um, it's a study of a community, community, community at the very northern tip of Sweden called Norrbotten, which translates to North Ground, um, and particularly in this community called Erva Kalix, which uh, looks something like this in the late 1800s. Um, and basically what this study has done is come from the Karolinska Institute, Karolinska Institute and from Umeå University in Sweden. It tracked um, the, the diet of grandparents, um, 164 men and 139 women from the late 1800s and early 1900s, and then tracked um, the health and outcome in their children and their grandchildren, all the way through to, to um, the late 1900s. And so what they found in this study was that descendants of um, Ovocalyx from the 1900s, um, some of them had uh, high diabetes mortality in their grandsons, um, but not granddaughters, if the paternal grandfather was exposed to an overabundant supply of food uh, during his prepubescent years. So a slow growth period, which is ages nine to 12 for boys. Um, in contrast, the paternal grandmother's food intake was linked to cardiovascular disease and mortality in granddaughters, but not in grandsons. So essentially what this study found was that if boys at the age of nine to 12 had a year um, that followed a low food abundance year to one where they might have been uh, overeating, that then their, their children and their great-grandchildren had a higher risk of mortality. 
a follow-up study from Stockholm University, and I'll just give this a shout out uh, because that's where my wife was, went to graduate school. Um, a a follow-up study of a larger group uh, of uh, individuals revealed that if grandpa had access to abundant foods uh, at this slow growth period, then his grandsons were found to have an increased risk of cancer. And so typically those grandchildren were dying about six years, uh, had a sh six year shorter lifespan than um, con control subjects who didn't overeat during this period. So this was suggesting then that there were metabolic changes induced by the eating behavior um, during pre-puberty. Pre um, and this was being passed on through the male lineage to subsequent generations. Um, and, and this is kind of an interesting phenomenon, right? And maybe a little bit troubling for us in the, um, are we paying for the sins of our ancestors uh, through these epigenetic pathways? It seems kind of unfair in many ways. And so, you know, some of the choices, of course, uh, are to have a balanced diet um, and, and eat in moderation. And it's not necessarily always the easiest thing to do. So another example I'll give you is work that our lab has directly been in, for, involved with, and it involves drug addiction um, and epigenetics. In particular, it involves uh, rats, and um, it's a study of rats which are addicted to cocaine. Um, and then they're withdrawn from the cocaine uh, for a period of time. And then they're given the option of either not exercising or having unlimited access to this kind of spinning wheel right here. Um, and what we found was if we studied these rats, uh, which had gone through the withdrawal and then they were reinstated with uh, the cue for cocaine uh, administration, that on this black bar right here, the um, rats which were sedentary, that didn't exercise, much more frequently uh, had responses to drug-seeking behaviors. So they're looking to find cocaine. Um, but in the yellow colors right here, if uh, during the withdrawal period, within one to seven days of the withdrawal period, these rats were giving unlimited exercise, um, then uh, within 15 days, they had many fewer responses um, of drug-seeking behavior. Um, however, if you look at these hashed bars right here, if there was a delay in the ability to exercise of seven days, um, then exercise didn't do anything if they were given exercise late during the withdrawal period. So this kind of opens up the concept that there are windows of opportunity um, during our life when perhaps um, our epigenetic state is malleable and that there might be experiences and lifestyle changes that can be made that um, affect us for a longer period of time. Um, and so this is in a similar way in the overcolic study with the overeating uh, during childhood. Um, another one that's kind of interesting is whether epigenetics um, can be influenced by social experience. And here's a study from the lab of Mike Meany where he studied epigenetic programming by maternal behavior. And this one was kind of interesting where he studied groups of rats. Um, and these rats could kind of be divided into two kinds of social behaviors. One where mothers who had babies um, had a low um, licking and grooming activity. And so licking and grooming in rats is kind of considered very uh, uh, positive maternal instincts, very caring. Um, and so these rats can be divided into those which were low, uh, low grooming and those which were high grooming. Um, and what this study and other studies found was that there were changes in the expressions of genes in the brain, and particularly in this medial preoptic area, um, which correlated with these behaviors. And the suggestion was that these gene expression changes where genes were 
became uh, marked with certain chemicals that might have turned them off, um, that these might persist into the next generation. Um, and these pups would also behaving in the way that their mothers did with a low uh, grooming behavior. And what was interesting about these studies is if they cross fostered the pups and so uh, switched a low grooming mother's baby uh, to, a, uh, another, to a mother which was high grooming, then you switch that, that behavior and the gene expression pattern um, based on the experience that those pups had received. But what was also kind of interesting was if you took a paintbrush and uh, basically stroked the pups um, in a kind of mimicking this licking behavior on the backs of these pups a few times a day, um, even with a low grooming mother, these pups could switch to high grooming uh, pups in the next generation. Um, and so these changes in gene uh, expression were being influenced by the experience these pups had. And what was interesting is these gene expression changes um, were, were occurring as pups, but were being maintained throughout the lives of these rats. And then it was speculated these were being passed on to the next generation. So I've given you a few examples of this, and, and one area which is getting a lot of attention now is aging. Um, so epigenetic changes occur during age, aging, and a, a, the question has often been, is that a cause of aging or is it a consequence of aging? Um, so aging is associated with altered uh, chemical marks that I've talked about on DNA or histones, and that can alter which genes are turned on and off. Um, but interestingly, aging can be delayed in a number of studies, but, um, which have been done in animals like uh, worms, fruit flies, mice, rats, uh, yeast, um, monkeys, and even some studies in humans, where you can see that you can delay um, aging without modifying DNA sequences at all. So this again suggests that there are epigenetic forms of, of uh, gene regulation that might be the primary mechanisms affecting aging. Interestingly, environmental, environmental factors can affect our health span and our lifespan by leading to modifications of DNA and histones. So knowing that, are we able to turn back the clock? Um, you know, can we reset our epigenetic clock and rejuvenate the cells, tissues of our body. Um, and this is kind of an area of interest, increasing interest. Um, and one of the mechanisms that's emerged over recent years um, is that caloric restriction may be one of the best mechanisms we know so far of reversing this aging clock. So dietary restriction, um, in particular caloric restric uh, restriction is a kind of a simple way to manipulate our metabolism. Um, and it's been shown to increase both the health span and lifespan of all of these species from yeast up to humans. Um, many studies have shown that caloric restriction delays aging related epigenetic alterations. Um, so, you know, caloric restriction isn't necessarily the easiest uh, thing to do. I know that firsthand, I like food. Um, and to eat it in abundance. Um, so people often would look to um, other alternatives for that. And can you, can you mimic caloric restriction in various ways? Um, rapamycin is one of the drugs which seems to be able to at least in part um, mimic caloric restriction. Metformin, a drug which is commonly given uh, during to di patients with diabetes, has also been shown to um, be effective in causing positive um, changes, metabolic changes to reverse the epigenetic clock. Other studies have shown aspirin, vitamin C, nicotinamide, all may help reset this clock. So kind of interesting, right, that, that we might be able to slow aging um, through manipulating epigenetic regulation um, through either caloric restriction or other types of experiences 
And that would include exercise uh, and, and diet. And so I'm kind of towards the uh, last part of my talk here, I'm gonna talk about cancer and that's something we're actively working on right now. And altered epigenetic uh, patterns are very noteworthy in cancers and particularly what we consider cancer gene activity is altered um, in various diseases. So in this sense, um, you can have inappropriate activation or turning on of genes, um, which you could consider cancer causing genes or those which increase chromosomal instability. So by that, I mean genes that might increase cellular proliferation, cellular division um, in tissues where that would be inappropriate. Um, another example is where genes which we are called tumor suppressor genes, and genes which prevent cancer development are inappropriately silenced. So a great example of that is the BRCA1 gene, which is quite famous in, in breast cancer for being mutated and increasing the risk of, of breast cancer in individuals who have this BRCA1 mutation. But in an epigenetic sense, the BRCA1 gene is inactivated in about 10 to 20% of sporadic breast and ovarian cancer patients without any mutation in the gene whatsoever. So the gene is fully functional, but it's turned off inappropriately through this epigenetic silencing mechanism. So um, that kind of begs the question of, are we able to intervene in this process in terms of cancer treatment? Can we fix it? So about 10 years ago, um, some FDA approved uh, drugs were starting to appear. Um, and, and at the time there were about four of these which um, influenced the chemical mark addition either onto DNA or onto these histone proteins I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a field which is developing, so you don't need to really read any of these right here. But on the right hand side, as of the fall of last year, you can see all of the drugs which are being developed or have been FDA approved for treatment um, in, in patients with various diseases and most commonly um, in cancers. And there's a whole slew of drugs which are in various phases of development, which are essentially targeting epigenetic regulation of how our genes are turned on or off. So the future looks positive, right? here, and particularly for people who have cancers with no known um, DNA mutations. And it's speculated that epigenetic misregulation might be at the heart of their disease. In other individuals with mutation of DNA, um, we can kind of manipulate if a, a cancer causing gene is inappropriately turned on by trying to turn it off um, through some of these targeted drug delivery mechanisms. So examples of this, um, early on, here's an example from Kevin Kelly's lab when he was at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And what you're seeing here is panels taken from, images taken from a patient or two different patients actually with metastatic laryngeal cancer. So cancer of the uh, voice box, and you can see uh, within their larynx right here, solid tumors um, pre-treatment. Um, these patients weren't responding particularly well to conventional treatment, um, but then they're giving an eight week course of a drug called Saha. This is an uh, in, uh, inhibitor of one of the enzymes involved in the epigenetic regulation. And you can see within eight weeks that the tumor is starting to necrose. So it's hollowing out here in the middle. Here's another image, very large tumor in this uh, larynx right here. And in eight weeks of treatment, you can see the tumor starting to die away or in another tumor right here. Another example here is a patient with um, a T-cell lymphoma um, with skin involvement. And so you can see this uh, unfortunate kind of skin reaction to the lymphoma right here, the cancer. Um, this patient was treated with a, an epigenetic uh, inhibiting drug called romadepsin, and you can see um, within a period of time that their symptoms 
are starting to clear up. So there's a lot of promise in this field in, in terms of drug treatments um, that are considered quite positive. So what do we do? We're interested in looking at epigenetic ways that cancer finds to be resistant to chemotherapy. And um, particularly we're interested in platinum chemotherapy. It's platinum compounds are very commonly used and it's estimated that 10 to 20% of all cancer patients receive um, these platinum type drugs, either cisplatin, which has been around for quite some time or carboplatin, um, very commonly used for solid tumors um, like bladder, uh, ovarian cancers and so on. Um, one of the unfortunate things about the dosing of these drugs is that there are a lot of side effects. Um, and most patients, more than 10% and probably many more, have some kind of side effects to these drugs. But one of the problems is with patients who receive these drugs is initially they respond very well. There might be tumor shrinkage, look quite promising, but very frequently this, the cancer reoccurs. And when it does reoccur, it's now resistant to the platinum therapy that was originally effective. So for example, more than 80% of stage three and four patients with ovarian cancer will display disease recurrence and resistance to, to platinum drugs after an initial response. And that typically is a really poor sign. So we were interested in finding out what are the mechanisms for this uh, resistance and what, particularly what are the epigenetic regulators involved? So uh, one of the examples I'll, I'll give you is that when you have a, a, a normal cell, um, it undergoes perhaps some kind of either DNA or epigenetic mutation. Um, this forms a tumor, which um, might respond positively to the platinum drugs. So most of the tumor cells are killed off, but there are cells which are resistant to the drug, which then can grow back and form a tumor. We're interested in finding epigenetic pathways in here that we might be able to block to now resensitize every one of these cells to platinum, um, making it so that there are no survivors. And here's an example of this. Don't worry about these numbers. But we found that we can um, interfere with an epigenetic pathway that adds a chemical mark to a histone protein. Um, um, we call it Y51 here. Um, and we can find that compared to a normal, uh, rapidly growing proliferating cell, that these cells are now killed by cisplatin. Um, but otherwise, uh, in the absence of cisplatin, they're very growing very rapidly. And so there's something special about adding a chemical mark um, to this particular position that causes chemoresistance to cisplatin. And the interesting thing we found was um, the same mark also was involved in chemoresistance to other drugs that are used in cancer therapy. So for example, 5 fluorouracil um, that's commonly used in combination with platinum drugs to treat lung cancer. So there might be epigenetic mechanisms that cancer cells use to escape one drug that also help it escape from other drugs. And that could give clues to why recurrent cancers are very difficult to treat. Um, so we'd like to figure out a way to uh, develop drugs that can stop this pathway from activating it as well. Um, so to do that, we need to find the, the, the writers of that chemical mark. Um, and I'll just summarize what we've found recently. And that involves uh, a gene uh, called BAS1B. And BAS1B um, is encodes for a protein which adds the chemical mark at that Y51 location on histones. So it adds the mark that causes chemo resistance to platinum drugs. Um, and if we focus then on uh, patients' uh, survival, and this is patients with bladder cancer, stage two bladder cancer, um, and these patients have been separated out through time. So at time of diagnosis, um, patients in blue have low or normal amounts of this BAS1B 
protein uh, compared to those in red who are patients who have high levels, abnormally high levels of BAS1B. And what we found was in a study here of almost 300 patients was that disease-free survival of these patients um, with stage two bladder cancer showed a 61 month difference. So these patients are much worse off. If we look at their overall survival, um, we find that these patients with high BAS1B tend to fare less well. They live 35 months shorter than the patients with low levels of BAS1B. And in fact, these patients um, seem to, you know, throughout the study period, um, more than 80% of them will survive. So it seems like uh, this is a problem. Um, BAS1B is abnormally high in about 38% of bladder cancers. So this is a normal bladder tissue. And here we can stain for this BAS1B protein in brown, and you can see how high it is. Uh, how, how overrepresented it is in this section of, of bladder cancer. Um, but the interesting thing we found, it's not just bladder cancer. So if we look at a survival of patients with lower grade gliomas, again, patients in blue with, let's say, uh, normal or low BAS1B compared to those with high BAS1B, the difference is quite striking. These patients um, die with 60 months sooner than patients with normal BAS1B, presumably because um, these patients are not responding to chemotherapy. Um, the same is true with st stomach adenocarcinoma, so gastric cancer. Again, you can see patients with high BAS1B essentially uh, don't fare very well at all. Um, so collectively, these studies um, that are presented today, those of others and those of ourselves, have displayed that there are a number of opportunities for preci precision medicine, right? If we can learn the mechanisms involved in the regulation of gene expression, if we can understand the mechanisms of chemo resistance in cancers, the influence of the environment on how our genes are turned on and off, or those of social experience, um, there's a, much, there's a lot of opportunity that we have moving forward um, to intervene in these processes when we think the outcome is particularly negative. Um, and that becomes important too when we think about subsequent generations, that some of these epigenetic traits can be passed on to our children and our grandchildren and perhaps onto subsequent generations. Um, so I'll end there and I'll just acknowledge the people who do the work. I, I talk about it, but um, the, the people who've done some of the studies I've shown today, um, my, my wife and partner in crime, Marilyn Prey Grant, um, has done the bulk of these studies. Um, it's kind of a family affair in our research in that at times my, my son Ben and Alex have been involved in working uh, on these projects too. Um, and also a number of undergraduates and graduate students um, and postdoctoral fellows who have been involved uh, listed right here. I want to thank Eric Green for actually providing some of the, the slides that I've shared with you today. Um, here, here are some of my collaborators. And then I want to point out Wendy Lynch and David Orbel in the study of exercise and cocaine addiction that I presented today. Uh, and with that, um, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, very interesting uh, and I think very well explained, a very complex topic for sure. Just as a reminder uh, to our audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen. You can type your question there and we're going to go through them as they come in. So Patrick, coming going back to um, what you talked about, caloric restriction and the turning back of the uh, aging clock. One of the questions we have here is, uh, is caloric restriction similar to intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating? Yeah, so that's one of the methods of caloric restriction. Um, it, it could be fasting and intermittent fasting. Um, the, those have been shown to be successful mechanisms of, of caloric restriction um, that do influence this pathway, yes. Okay.
Um, and it's somewhat related to that, um, and you may have to explain what autophagy, autophagy is, um, because the question here is, can fasting cause uh, uh, autophagy, and, and does autophagy account for reversing aging as well? Right. Yeah, so I think the question comes from the idea is, as we age, we, we, um, we accumulate a lot of senescence cells, and it's been shown to be beneficial to remove those um, senescent cells um, can reverse some of these epigenetic traits we've talked about. Autophagy is one of these ways to do that. So autophagy um, is a mechanism for, uh, uh, you know, cells of our body to swallow up um, dead and decaying cells and, and other, uh, let's say, debris that we might accumulate in our bodies. Um, so, um, yeah, so those, those pathways, and I, I don't know how much exactly has been done, but autophagy um, and removal of um, these senescent cells has been show, suggested to be a positive um, way to reverse our uh, aging clock. Great, thank you. Okay, pivoting a little bit to what you said about your generational studies, uh, you know, where you had the uh, grandfather, daughter, and, and child. Um, that, I think, prompts several different questions, but one very important one that was posted here is the maternal guilt and responsibility for all types of behaviors that might influence your, your children, like somebody who actually worked in OBGYN has been observing, you know, if something is wrong with your child, the question comes up immediately, oh, oh my God, what did I do wrong, you know, as, as a mother? Um, and what you were showing earlier, the generational um, effects that either environmental exposure or something like that could have on, on future generations. How do we uh, prevent that we're returning back to this guilt and blame. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we can't really carry guilt for things we don't know about, right? I think we can only, we can only bear responsibility for things we're aware of and, and um, take some accountability for that. But it's a, it's a good point because, you know, as we, as we discover these things, um, we could start to reflect, well, maybe I should have, you know, I could have done that differently. Um, I, I think as a, um, as a parent, of course, we want the best interests for our children, um, but we, we, we can't be guilty for all of the life choices we make in, in terms of um, when we we're looking for the best for our children, especially um, influencing these kind of things. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, some of the, some of the difficult things that, um, some of the things we were learning, I, I think, uh, are things like exposure to smoke, cigarette smoke. Um, in, in um, you know, it could be our parents uh, and that we've never been exposed to cigarettes ourselves, um, but that can have an effect and an, an imprint on our DNA um, and from their social and environmental experiences um, that's carried to that carried to them. Um, there's so much we don't know though. There's so much we don't know um, about how long these things persist. Um, we, we, we believe many of these things are reversible, um, but there's a lot we don't know about things we could or couldn't have done that could influence our kids. Um, and, and so, you know, we can't really carry a lot of guilt uh, about that and, and you know, worry about every single decision we make uh, being a negative one. Uh, the human species is very resilient. We have a lot of uh, things in place to kind of take care of our bodies, um, but we're starting, we are starting to become aware of things um, that can influence those, those choices. And, and for example, you know, um, it's, it sounds straightforward, but not smoking, um, not overeating are, are two choices. And sometimes it's difficult, but um, that those are choices that we can make um, that, that you know, will pass on effects through future generations. These um, uh, generational consequences, are those predispositions or are those automatic, or automatically present in the in the future generation. Now you, like you mentioned, the um, overeating. If your grandparents, for example, are in a famine or something like that, uh, in future generation, is that something that needs to be triggered, or is it a uh, is it a predisposition, or do you 
see that it's an automatic drive to a rate. Right. So that, that's a very good question. And, and um, the Overcalix study, I think, uh, doesn't have, um, you know, even though it's, it's 164 men, 139 women, it's still not probably large enough to kind of thread that out. And they have 1,818 descendants. Um, but we need a little bit more power in terms of, of really being able to figure that out. But it's not the same for everybody. So it's not everybody who went through that experience had the same outcome. So probably there is a predisposition for this and it's a combination of influences. And you can think of some of these epigenetic mechanisms as fine tuning um, some underlying uh, predisposition perhaps. Um, but I think we still have a lot to learn. We don't you know, there's, we don't have answers to all of these things. Um, you know, we could say smoking causes cancer in some people, but not everybody. Um, and, you know, there's a good question to why is that? Uh, why is that the case? Some people are more susceptible than others. And that was actually one of the questions uh, from mm -hmm. one of our attendees, you know, that some people who do smoke or overeat, you know, they do live to a, an old age. And uh, I guess we don't really fully understand why that is in, in some individuals and not others. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a combination of multiple factors. And, and this is just one of the layers. Mm -hmm. One more question related to the um, generational study. You mentioned that the effects might be reversible. Um, and you mentioned also some positive effects, um, you know, uh, like exercise, for example. Are there any studies that, that show that, for example, exercise or any, any other positive influence um, could reverse that even that generational um, influence on your, on your epigenetics? Yeah, so, so uh, it's true. Um, exercise isn't necessarily the most effective way for weight loss, for example, diet is, but exercise has been shown in isolation to have a positive effect in, in, in some of the aging related changes that occur, the accumulation of marks of, of aging. Um, those can be slowed down by exercise, for example. Um, I, I gave the example of, uh, of addiction, um, intervention of addiction. Um, so there are definitely positives from exercise um, that are influencing. And again, we, we have a lot to learn about how that's achieved. Mm -hmm. um, so it, here's another question actually related to the study that you should an exercise and addiction. And the question just is if you can review some of the important findings from that study on the exercise and addict, addiction study again. Yeah, so what, we've, what that particular study was, um, was that in, in rats which were addicted to cocaine who went through withdrawal, um, the, if you intervened early um, during the withdrawal process, those rats were, um, had much fewer drug-seeking behaviors when you reinstate the, the drug or the cues for the drug. Um, that seems to be a, a, a um, exercise influenced only within the first seven days of withdrawal. And if we went later, um, that effect was completely lost. Um, if exercise was given to those rats um, during the early pay phase and the late phase, so the first week after withdrawal and the second week after withdrawal, um, it was kind of equivalent to just having early exercise. So there's a window of opportunity somehow in that early phase. So what we're currently doing is looking at the gene expression changes in the brain uh, of different, uh, different regions of the brain in the rats, um, which respond uh, to exercise um, and those which receive late or throughout exercise. And we're looking for transcriptional changes. Uh, so some of the things we've seen are, are changes, for example, in the BDNF, which is a classic kind of um, a, a drug addiction, if you will, reward uh, gene. Um, but, but we're also finding new things. So we're seeing some receptors in the brain uh, which are regulated in a positive way uh, by exercise during withdrawal. And um, it, it seems somehow to override um, the, the, uh, the drive for uh, relapse. Very interesting. 
Um, we're almost at time here. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, Patrick. I know we have more questions. Okay. Uh, we will ask Dr. Grant to answer those offline and look for your answers on our website, which is uh, Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University uh, Research in Action. If you just Google uh, FAU and Research in Action, you should be able to find it. And just as a reminder, we will go on summer break after today and we'll be back in September. So look out for uh, announcements on that as well. All right, here's the last question of the day. Um, can epigenetics affect neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's? Yes, yeah, so uh, one of the projects we do work on is um, ataxia. And so it's a neurodegenerative disease, um, late onset like Alzheimer's. Um, and what we've found there is there's a mutation that's actually uh, in a gene which that gene is just part of a epigenetic regulating uh, activity. So it's a DNA mutation, but it affects a epigenetic regulator. And that has another series of consequences. Um, so there are definitely layers of epigenetic regulation um, in ataxia, neurodegeneration. We believe also we've seen some things in Huntington's disease um, and, and within um, Alzheimer's, I think, we're also, you know, some of the studies we're starting to look at now are looking for epigenetic regulation that influences Alzheimer's. And, um, you know, I'd be very surprised if there is not an epigenetic component that influences the timing and severity of, of diseases like Alzheimer's. Um, even in those who are predispos predisposed for it, I, I think there's going to be a component there. Great. Looking forward to more results in the future, um, Patrick. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. We hope to see you all back in September. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.